and I'll be your host for today. And I also take this opportunity to welcome all of you on behalf of Save the Children Bal Raksha Bharat and CBGA, Center for the Budget and Governance Accountability. And why we have gathered here is for something really, really significant and really important and pivotal at this point in time. We have gathered here for the launch of our report, Cost of Universalizing Early Childhood Education in India. But before we begin with the proceedings of the evening and afternoon and uh, day, uh, it's very important to also pontificate as to why we are here and why now. Why us and why now? Uh, there's no denying, we all know, there's no denying or rather there's an unequivocal agreement amongst all of us that education has a redeeming and aspirational value. And more so for the early childhood because it's not just for the individual child but it contributes to the larger nation and society building. And India in its very pioneering move a decade ago, more than a decade ago, uh, made education given given status of right to the education but still as we celebrate our 75th year of independence and throw in the context of pandemic the challenges that already were seem to have made that realization of right a little more distant than the de than desired for all the children and when we uh, talk about the pandemic and the challenges uh, about the early childhood and learning, it's important that we move from just the rhetoric to reality, a collective action. And this report is especially significant because for the first time ever, this report is talking about what does it take, the investment and public financing for learning. And we have some really distinguished and accomplished panel members and speakers in this room who bring their insights from the relentless work in the sector of education which will point us in the direction where we want to be for all children in India so that every child in the country gets the right start when it comes to foundational and early learning. And uh, before we sort of initiate uh, the conversation, it's very important to also note that this is just the beginning. And uh, to set the context, I would like to invite Sudarshan Suchi, uh, who is our CEO, to just make some opening remarks and what this report means for Save the Children and our joint initiative with Save the Children and CBGA. Sudarshan, over to you. Uh, afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. And uh, I, I think, um, you know, in terms of the larger aspiration of this report and many such reports and Pragya mentioned about the right to education and uh, I, I believe that you know the whole idea in terms of our theory of change is to offer certain directional contexts to the government to be able to bring change at scale and I think uh, what we don't say or hesitate to say that the RTE or the right to education is a com has to be accompanied by DFE, that's duty for education. So if the children have the right, somebody needs to fulfill that duty to make their right a reality. And um, for me, cost as a word is always a trigger. Cost looks like a burden actually. It, it looks like as if somebody is going to carry some burden. We, we are talking actually about investments. And um, all of us are just... Uh, if you reminiscence few weeks back, I think we couldn't have missed that slogan of Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav. I mean, it was just all around everywhere. And, um, and then there was also this statement that India will be a developed country in 2047. What will it take in 25 years from now? What will it take for us to be developed? And what was it in terms of Amrit Mahotsav? If bulk of the children remain uneducated or without access to education. So what will it take to ensure providing that quality education, particularly at the foundational level? Because um, I think uh, I, I, I've grown, I've spent a whole lifetime by and large working around livelihoods, farming, agriculture, trees, cultivation. And one very elementary stuff one learnt is that the tree that you see standing tall above is only in proportion to the roots that are there below. The strength of the roots is what gives eventually the tree 
the entire shape, the size, the capacities, the productivity, fruiting, everything. And I think that's what this report is trying to establish uh, with our team that the roots that we want to give the children is what will shape up the future. So the country can't just become developed without having invested in terms of universalizing that particular right that people will get a good stable you know education as a right start in terms of getting that foundational learning um, i also come from a school of thought that not all of that education happens within the four walls of schools so how do we create a generally an atmosphere or a, a whole culture of seeking knowledge and education. I think it takes parents, it takes communities, it takes the teachers, it takes all of us around to be, you know, encouraging curiosity, to be encouraging uh, seeking, to encourage inquiry and to encourage making mistakes. I mean, things we probably hesitate to even uh, provide as right even in organizations where we work. And um, I, I think undeniably, I mean, we may not say it in public, but we, we, are, we do come from a very feudal context as a country. So at home, the father in society is the people with power, ranks, position. So actually everything that can be loaded on a child to prevent them from getting educated is what we are trying to turn the tide around. And this cost or universalization of this, I think, has to be accompanied by a very wholesome engagement around recognizing that it's an investment, it's not a cost. And what we invest today and how deep the roots and how strong, both the primary root and the tertiary roots, however strong they are, the plant standing above is going to be only that stable and strong. And, and the whole idea of this country, I don't know, Amrit Mahotsav will be what Mahotsav uh, in 100 years, you know, Shat Mahotsav, some, uh, whatever is the appropriate word, but wo utna hi majboot hoga jitne, you know, the kids today who are born are going to be 25 then, and the majority of the country is going to be youth. So we have a choice. Do we want to invest, make education happen that they seek a country of their desire and create it, or out of ignorance and out of existential issues they either perish or they just resigned to a fate that is destined for them so we have those choices and i think this report is going to make a small effort forward saying that in those choices should we look at investments are they there are those kind of monies available in the country i think uh, i i would certainly shout out loud that that money is out there much more is there it's just a question of a commitment of that finding its channel, you know, into the right places. You know, we, we read actually even newspapers, you know, cover different things in different pages. So it's in some economic page. Education will be reserved in one page. It's in the page on business or economics. You may read what are the, how much NPA is there in the banks or something, or how much losses some corporate has happened. So if you just add up some of those numbers and pick, you'll find that well, a presto education could have happened with any one of these, uh, you know, pillars. It's, it's not that simplistic, but I'm just saying if you look at a larger image, we have the resources, we need the commitment, we need affirmative action. And that's what I said uh, purely, um, partly in this, not purely in this, that the duty for education has got to come for somebody somewhere who are held accountable and maybe the start is today that every child who exists today or is going to be born, what will it take to assure them the right start in terms of foundational learning? And if that is there, how will this country look like when the 100 years get completed or when we say that uh, the dev India is developed of our kind? So thank you all for joining us. I think today is just a very small step in trying to trigger out a debate on this. So if there are 30, 50 odd of us here today, I am hoping we 50 can reach out to many others and stir up. Ours is the first word and not the last word. And we are happy that there could be plurality of opinions, there could be dissent. So we, all we are saying is 
that let's together find resources in our own respective ways to make sure that those children get the kind of roots which will shape up a wonderful tree so thank you again and welcome and over to you for much more knowledgeable and valuable discussions thank you thank you so much sudarshan uh you were talking about the education and the investment and we also know that it's only the collective action india has resources india has systems in place and as we know that large part like the more majority of education system is dependent on government schools and it's so important to also bring in the insights and insider uh, who is with us to share that what are what does it take for system to strengthen to deliver for children and with that i would like to introduce our speaker guest and who is also making keynote address mr vrinda swaroop who has been one of the longest standing bureaucrat in the sector of education so we are so pleased to have you with us on this day when we are talking about what does it take for the road ahead uh and your contribution to education is absolutely enviable and we couldn't benefit more from your presence than when we are launching the report here so welcome ma'am and we would love to hear from you to give push us in the direction what will it take the country to be there thank you thank you very much i still jot down points <laughs> Good afternoon everyone. It's actually a pleasure to be with you all today and uh, a topic and a subject which when Kamal approached me about it was uh, something that uh, was very close to my heart. And uh, <coughs> so this is a great time to be amongst people who have done this wonderful study and uh, after going through it i i i think in all my career and i have been a director icds also in my days you younger days uh, apart from my stint with the uh, education sector and um, that i've never seen such a comprehensive and well argued uh, where all points of view uh, which are relevant to this topic were there so th i compliment the authors uh, on this and uh, and i take this opportunity therefore to to sort of build upon what is already there in in that wonderful document um but more of it from a practitioner's point of view uh and also somebody who's a little more familiar with the insides of government and uh, where are the pressure points where where is the leverage and uh, uh what is possible uh to make uh, things work so i think uh when i say that i think the country is now poised for a huge investment and scale for ece and uh i remember discourse i remember debates arguments within and outside government in the early 90s when a similar story was similar uh, push was made for universal elementary education and it was a f you know it was an argument which had been built over decades it's not as if it happened but it, as they say you know time has come for an idea and we were fort fortunate in that in the early uh, 90s uh, that period happened there were various factors which contributed to it one of course was a huge international pressure and uh, the the jomtian conference the the uh, the unesco's <coughs> movement for universal ed so there were a lot of forces internationally which had been working and which were ratcheting up uh, the importance of a universal elementary education but more than that i think domestically and there was work which ngos had done uh, many state governments had forged ahead so there was a domestic pressure also 
uh, which spun off on the fact that something must be done uh, to be able to make this universal. And then, of course, it's the political leadership. Without that, uh, you know, in governments, you can't go to scale. And that realization, and then once you get into a political leadership which is willing uh, uh, to be able to take things forward on that direction, then the designing or the financing or the investments or where to locate the money, what is the kind of design apparatus we need to implement this across, all this happens. And, uh, you know, when we are in the thick of it, we don't realize it. But when you step back, you do realize that uh, these are the many things which have made this possible. And then, of course, you get totally involved in how to get it going and off the ground. And in India, it's a, it's a complex, uh, uh, you know, way forward because you do look at a center state relationship. Uh, we work together. We work in collaboration. We have our differences. But we collaborate. And so you have to create that space and that mechanism to be able. So a lot of innovation happened and, and things got off the ground. There are many in this room who have shared that journey and seen the excitement of that journey. And also to, to the extent that we see, yes, access to edu elementary education, access to girls, inclusion, all these things were the spin-offs. They were not in the original design, but you know they happened. So I, why I recount this is only because to say that ECE, was always an insignificant subset of that effort. It was there, it was on the, uh, on the map, but you, know, you prioritize and you say, no, it's important for me to build the schools and get the teachers because that's what makes a school work. And, but I think we are over that phase. We are seriously, and I think this is the current atmosphere, looking at quality and the learning outcomes and the learning levels which are happening in schooling. So I see a lot of activity, and I still do travel and remain associated with education. I see a lot of activity happening in every state, in every corner of the country, on how to improve learning, how to make uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the spiral of learning come about so that a child finishing grade 5 knows what grade 5 le learning levels are. So there's a lot of effort going on. I think the focus is there. But I would still say, uh, going back to your introductory comments, that if you are looking at the root, then all that learning curve that you're trying to build uh, would become so much easier to handle if we had a basic uh, ECC exposure for our children. And I think it's been historically recorded, uh, research has recorded, and your latest study says. So this, that, that if any child is exposed to any ECC um, exposure, I should say, at the level of uh, the three to six age group, then um, all the more uh, the, the learning curve will be very different even from class one upwards, which is of the formal schooling. And this is where the maximum learning cognitive development happens. I think <coughs> when we used to argue, this is just an aside, when we used to argue for ECC interventions in DPP programs or the Sarv Shiksha Abhyan or Samagri Shiksha, we were often told that no, 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 this is Indian society and the kid learns a lot on the grandparents' knee and you don't know there is no replacement on earth for this kind of thing. Now, well, as that may be partially true also, but we are looking at a completely different uh, pattern of stimulation, uh, learning, which is, which is so much more different and adds enormous value to the child's development. But I think today's context is different. And why I say that is because with the universal spread of at least access to education, communities today are hugely aspirational and in that early childhood education and care is part of that aspiration now. Whatever we may say about Anganwadis, they have brought to the village a possibility that there is a place where the child can go for some stimulation of the mind, uh, some, some uh, thing to play with, something to have an exposure which is different from the household. So I think today we have a country which is growing 
economically. With economics, you get a lot of aspiration. It's the age of the internet. Everybody has a mobile. They're watching all kinds of things on it, including stuff which should be done for early childhood education. So there is a, a, a curve which is, uh, which is pushing us towards uh, a full-blown recognition of uh, valuable ECE. Uh, families are becoming nucleated. Even rural women have taken to work in many ways, or at least the work they were doing outside the household is being recognized. Uh, child care has become a very major issue, even in the smallest Mofassal towns that we are talking about. So there is a change of perception and inspiration and, and, and what I call the community uh, you know, receptivity to such ideas, the community demand for such ideas. So in that context, I think the time has come for, for us to uh, look at this squarely. Reflection of it is already shown in the political documents which we are seeing recently. Whether you look at NEP uh, 2020 or you look at any of the postulates which the ECCE sector is putting out, uh, we are seeing that you know the 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 uh, the hand of the of on the uh, uh, time face is now more or less all three are coming together on a place where ECCE is suddenly becoming. Uh, and accepted and required and a much needed um, uh, and so you when your report goes out and I'm sure it will create uh, a lot of uh, read as well as understanding uh, hopefully in in all government and I include government state governments etc uh, to be able to be able to respond that this is a, a requirement so this brings me to that if, if the atmosphere is so good financing apart, what are the real issues which hit us? Where are our bottlenecks? Where is it that we need to um, leverage? And I broadly put them, of course, financing is a much simpler uh, area to understand with all its complexity. But uh, I think more, I'd spend a little few minutes on where, where do I see the structural weaknesses? And uh, this is where we probably need to leverage some of it you brought out in your study, uh, which is where we need to be more persuasive with policymakers, with governments, uh, and even in the world of NGOs and uh, think tanks and researchers, where we can we can din this out uh, and make it a crescendo or a noise which will be heeded. So one is that you know our policy framework on ECE, or even if I enlarge it to ECCE, there's a there's a big flaw here. We we do not think of the country as a whole, where there is a private sector, where there is a public sector. Our problem has been that anything below class one, we tend to. Uh, lower our sights. Our vision can be much higher, it, it, it exists also, but we bring it down, we dumb it down to what has become now a bottleneck around us for all its worth and value is the ICDS scheme. Uh, when policy is made, you invariably start thinking about, you know, will the ICDS system be able to take this? Uh, now, ICDS is a great system. I have worked in it. I have, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, know its, 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 uh, its uh, shortcomings also, but it's a great scheme on paper. Only if we ran it a little better, and some states do a marvelous job of it with very good dividends. So, why do we think only of ECC is a sector where there can be many players? Why do I say this? We have no standardized, legally viable qualifications for an ECC teacher e who handles ECE or ECCE. Why do I have to think that it's only the Anganwadi worker who gives preschool? There is a host of us, as you brought out in your report also, that there, is, there are a variety of uh, 
uh, you know channels through which ECE is being imparted today, even today. So, and I work sometimes closely with the, uh, huge private sector uh, chains of schools also. And there is nowhere that I can find what should I hire as a preschool teacher. And many times we have to train them on the job. There's an NTT, there are all these kind of things. Well meant, but not recognized, not given legal uh, le legitimacy. So I remember even in teachers, for school teachers, till the NCT Act was passed, there was no legitimacy except feared by a, by a board, school board or something. Ab to, there are not even any system like that. So once the NCT came in, then the standardization and then the curricula which that builds because after all if you have to have qualifications you have to have some standardized curricula what is the learning you want that teacher to know so a beard you can have 10 flexible models of beard so i'm sure you can have 10 flexible models for for an ecc or a ec worker which can include your anganwadis but that doesn't mean you come down to the lowest denominator so this this is something which we are stuck in and it leads to a lot of issues uh, but first of all, it is, and this is something which I would urge this, uh, this study also to include, uh, even in a, uh, in, a, in a subsequent page, but which is that you must standardize who is a good recognized ECE teacher. So, you know, there are women and men who just walk out of college and they say, we, we want to teach. And we, you know, why not? But that's not it. They're not trained. <laughs> Another point which I think you have brought out in your study actually is about um, standardization of uh, what is to be the curriculum. So I think this is a direct link with that. But if if but what can you do with the curriculum if you don't have a teacher whose qualifications you recognize? So I think it's linked more or less to that uh, point that you're doing. But I would put far more pressure on bringing the government to bring a legislation nothing less works in india to get what is an ecc work i've had this debate in the nct for many years but the nct charter says from class one so what do you do uh, and and nobody in either the department of uh, uh, you know the ministry of women and child nor in the education in education said yet to hamare uh, rules of business mein nahi hai. this rules of business is with WCD, but it doesn't matter, government is one, let WCD announce it or whoever they think appropriate. The other uh, is about learning outcomes, uh, which is something we discovered in a very hard way through in education, uh, which something which, which at least the ECE sector should start and there is a lot of material internationally available which uh, brings uh, what is the learning outcomes that you want at the end of uh, you know, the first year of preschooling, second year, third year. Now, the government says three years of preschooling, but we should be able to define that. We should be able to say what, what is the learning outcomes you get. You know, you'll be surprised. Some of the best chains of uh, who's supposed to provide ECE are actually what he mentions in his book, uh, in his study, that they all t come down to reading, writing, and the parents are very happy. And if you don't do it, then they come and say, why aren't you doing this? Uh, so that realization, that perception that this is not the learning outcome you need, I'm saying it in a negative way, but I think these need to be defined, the, the, uh, the structure of education at that level, uh, the learning outcome should be defined right in the beginning, again, which is linked to the curriculum issue, etc. And also the institutionalization of much of this. So who is responsible for curriculum? Who is responsible to define learning outcome? Today, in the private sector, I find most schools are shifting to Cambridge or IB for early years education because they feel that this has got these things defined. If I do a random stuff, uh, the, the, um, this is not going to, uh, sorry. So this is not going to be able to uh, uh, really structure my, uh, my discourse in the uh, pre-primary years. Uh, 
So most policy frameworks are still skipping all these uh, issues. Now, if I if I take NIPSED or do I take the NCRT curriculum? Now, I believe NCF uh, work, which is going on in the NCRT, is also looking at some of the uh, preschool uh, education, which was always actually in their mandate. But now, who will pick that up? Or is, will it be something else coming out of NIPSED or a regional training center in a in a state? Uh, under the ICDS scheme which will be adopted. So these are things which are very easily solvable and I think as pressure groups you should start working on these and say define these. It doesn't matter who defines it, but define this. So these frameworks, uh, this was all missing from the government framework so far. The other and uh, probably um, uh, significant uh, issue is about how governments collaborate, center, state, uh, within the central government, uh, two, three departments deal with this social welfare, uh, WCD, uh, Ministry of Education, and their definitions. I think I had a much easier time in the 90s because uh, 80s and 90s, the ministry was one, and WCD and education would two parts of the same uh, uh, ministry. And so coordination was sometimes far more effective. And uh, I, I remember spending at least 10 years of my career, both in education and in the, uh, in the ICDS system, to get schools and Anganwaris together. And uh, Tamil Nadu was a great case in point, and it still remains a great case in point. But I worked in UP, where it was very tough to get this convergence together, but we even we managed to get 60 percent uh, Anganwadis into school where it, it was physically possible. And I was in Banaras last week and happily found that it's still working and, and there is, there is a, a happy coexistence. So, so that, but that was a, that was a one-off solution at that point of time, etc. It's no longer working because the sector of ECC is far more evolved now. The, the number of kids and the aspirations of the community are knocking on its door and is it delivering or is it not delivering that and the question is in most cases you know it's just partially delivering and as you say in your report you know you get sunk into supplementary nutrition issues rather than you get into the preschool issues uh, asadullah and uh, kamal have both worked with me in, in trying to get the ecc ece component of the icds going and those are lessons which I think are valid even now, that convergence works up to a point, but after that you have to have standards and, 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 uh, and outcomes which, which you must be measured against. If you are not measuring, then you have a problem. Lastly, I will come to the issue about um, uh, financing. Um, uh, it is the bugbear, it is the final uh, investment which which is required to be able to give Philip to all those ideas that we have about uh, dramatic change in this sector. And, and you've done a great analysis in your uh, study about the percentage of the GDP that it would require to uh, get this done. And uh, <coughs> I think that pressure needs to be continuously maintained. Uh, there is no doubt about that. But if I may suggest, uh, that again, a standardization approach is much better than saying how much it costs me for the ICDS or how much does it cost me to run a standalone preschool or how much does it. It is a sectoral approach which is required, no matter how you locate the pre, uh, preschool. And I think the NEP also recognizes that when it says there can be options. But if you standardize uh, the requirements of, a, of an ECC investment by component, roughly, I think that is far, far more useful a tool for government, provided government is doing it for the own co whole country and not for the ICDS. Otherwise, you get bogged down into the same. Uh, so, so the pattern design is something which we can suggest and we should suggest and we should cost it to a standardized uh, learning outcome, uh, the inputs which would be required and so on and so forth. And an attempt has been made and I appreciate what, is be, what has happened, but I would, 
I would not break it up into models. I would say this is what it costs to run it anywhere in whatever kind of situation you want to do. Uh, there is a mention of a CES in your study, which I think is a good idea and we should push for it. Even education, elementary education, universalization is done. We had a CES. We had a CES for higher education when we were revamping many things in higher education. Uh, and there have been examples like this in other sectors too. I think this is a time to push. I know the present government is not in favor of many CESs, etc. And they have their sound arguments for this. But this is one push that we can make because this is targeted funds. And uh, I know as a joint secretary, as an additional secretary and secretary, I have sat with the government and said, where is this money that you have raised on this cess? It has not come to my budget. These are good pressures to build up within the government also uh, to be able to get the financing which is due. But foremost, I think, uh, is the issue of what the Article 45 says now in the directive principles of state policy. It says you will universalize ECE. It also says, uh, it is also said in your latest policy document. So, so on a policy framework to substantiate it with a CES, uh, because government can't accommodate it in its given resources is a worthwhile thing to press for. And I would join you in pressing it because it's something which, uh, which whether it is Save the Children or it's UNICEF, which has been working, which is a close advisor and friend of government, uh, this pressure has to be mounted continuously. So uh, if, we, if we are able to achieve standardization, if we are able to push for a budgetary allocation which is backed by a CES, targeted CES, and uh, which looks at standardization beyond the ICDS pale, which is for the sector, and especially for what again is very important is the qualification of an ECC worker, the curriculum, the learning outcomes. If we press for these three, four components, um, I think our, our hit to where we are trying to uh, be persuasive would be far more productive. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for sharing such an insider insight from the system and that is also pointing out where are the leveraging points for us to move forward if we were to move collectively. Uh, and the last bit about financing that you, start, you touched upon uh, segues into our next speaker and we would love to hear more about investment and financing and we would like to invite Skavita Rao. Uh, and she is an eminent emo economist and presently the director of National Institute of Public Finance and Policy to dwell on this a little more to understand what it takes to finance and invest and cost in early education. Thank you. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much um, for two things. I can close the laptop, right? Um, uh, firstly, I haven't nev I've never worked on education, so you started an educating process for me, and for that, I say thank you. Um, I have uh, worked a lot on taxes more than on, on the expenditure side of government. And so um, it was a learning experience for me to figure out, to understand uh, what uh, the, uh, the nuance is, what the question is. Um, so I won't uh, try to opine about uh, about the ECE except for uh, sort of adding two layman dimensions to uh, why I think it's important. Um, the first uh, adding to what uh, ma'am was just talking about uh, is uh, the idea that India is moving from uh, a community-based, joint family-based structure to uh, a highly mobile population and uh, therefore mm, population which does not have roots in the places that they live in currently, which effectively means you need 
more uh, support services to ensure that families can have a safe environment for their children as well as for uh, workforce participation by women. So I think that is one dimension of this whole conversation that is not education, but uh, is, a, is in a sense a support system which aids uh, the transformation of the economy. And therefore, that is one attraction that I see. Um, so that, I think, is, uh, is important. The other uh, dimension which um, I will position it slightly differently is uh, I think in India at this moment we are going through uh, a bit of an existential crisis in trying to determine what we want state, what we want the government to do, what all are the activities that we would like the governments to intervene on. Uh, ideally we would like them to do a whole lot uh, but uh, we are seeing, if you look at the debate at the state government levels as well, there is a lot of debate on uh, do you want them to do uh, physical infrastructure, do you want them to do education, do you want them to provide electricity, um, food, what are the demands that we want to place on government. And uh, unfortunately, coming from a public finance background, uh, we tend to say, well, do you have the resources to do all of those things? And therefore, um, if we don't uh, have the resources to do the wish list on every single topic that we would like to see, uh, then we have to prioritize. And uh, we perhaps also have to find ways of uh, making the most for the money that's available. So I think uh, a debate today in India is is paramount on trying to say what do we want, what is of priority to the citizens of the country. Um, and I think that this report does an interesting job of positioning such a conversation from hap in, in, in starting, where we want to ask uh, what we want the state to do for us, uh, what we want to see happen in our communities and societies. And that, I think, is an important debate. Um, why I'm uh, raising this issue is um, invariably we'll find a lot of sector studies which say, you know, in order to achieve this, we need to spend this much. Uh, in order to achieve this, we need to spend this much. Um, while we believe we are targeting the government in these reports, we are trying to address the government and say, you know, government needs to do so and so. I think the pressure for governments to do so and so only comes when the citizen starts demanding that we would like to see engagement, we would like to see something happening on this front. So I think that is a conversation that you are aiding and I would see that as an added uh, advantage of the report and so kudos to you, congratulations. Um, turning to uh, the other dimension of um, do we have the resources to do all of it? And therefore, um, what else should we be looking at? Um, as uh, the discussion on the goods and services tax uh, started in India, we had a huge conversation happening on whether we want more cesses, whether we want more surcharges, whether we want uh, allocated funds to be put into uh, segregated users. And uh, so there are there are two ways of looking at it. Uh, one argument is to say that um, resources are fungible. So if I created, create a dedicated source, uh, governments stop putting in primary sources. So a, a cess doesn't necessarily ensure additional money until governments are committed to give that money. So the primary job is to convince the government that this is what is necessary. The rest will happen. So that, I think, is one uh, important dimension when we're looking at financing. The second, uh, while ma'am uh, was uh, very articulate in saying that uh, keep it away from ICDS uh, conversation, not from the ICDS institution, I think increasingly I am trying to uh, imagine a world where we can do many things with the same resources. Uh, can we do multi, uh, sort of multitasking with the same set of resources? Uh, because uh, every conversation is going to end with uh, the government saying, 
you know we don't have money so that is my my difficulty and so i am a little tempted to say can we piggyback on some other institutions in order to make a push uh, instead of trying to build a whole infrastructure for ece alone but uh, that is another point of view uh, the third aspect which i think uh, does find a lot of mention in the report and uh, from what little i read apart from the report is uh does uh, the ece program contribute to academic learning alone or does it contribute uh to uh, overall um, um social and uh, psychological development of children and therefore to more mature or more stable citizens and that seems to be the other line of uh, literature in the ice space ece space uh, where uh, people are evaluating whether it impacts your Uh, educational performance on one side but it impacts your long term um behavioral patterns it impacts your ability to sustain and hold jobs it impacts your ability to refrain from uh, violence from drugs and and all of that whole literature and i think it's uh, equally important to focus on that dimension because uh, uh we'll have a very young and um a very large population Uh, we are still in the phase of a growing population and uh, if we want a stable and a viable economy and society it's important for um, social structures to be strengthened instead of uh, people's perceptions on individualizing um, systems and i think that is the other dimension that uh, i am excited of uh, looking at in the ec space so um, i think that is an interesting uh, aspect to focus on um i think in the education space we have been asking for 6% of gdp to be spent on education and we are still struggling to get uh, compliance on that um adding another 2% of gdp to ensure ec happens takes it to 8% um if we are optimistic i will say let's do it but i think uh yeah we are still trying to build roads so how do we take this conversation from roads to education i think is our big challenge uh, i'm not sure i have an answer to you i haven't worked in this space but i think you all are doing great work and so i'll congratulate you on that but i think the conversation is to get more citizens engaged into this uh and not depend on only the think tanks to be able to provide uh, leadership i'll stop with that thank you oh uh, thank you so much i think with both the speakers i mean it validates uh what the report is trying to pontificate for early childhood learning in india um uh, and let's have a little more into what the report really uh holds and for that i would like to invite uh kamal gor who is our deputy director of education at save the children our very own advocate internally and a powerful force to reckon with advocating with external world welcome kamal thank you so much i think thank you for joining us um personally it's 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 an I mean I'm so excited like a child that you know this this is taking off finally we are unfolding this study because um we started working on this this kind of concept I think when I'm saying we we I'm talking about the community uh I'm talking about the sector not save the children here uh we started working with on this from the longitudinal study time right uh, where professor call made an attempt to cost um uh, what these best uh, what good uh, good practices right if i people who have worked with professor call am, am i using the right terminology i don't know uh, she talked about good models and uh, not best practices and um, there were models right 12 12 models which came up and um attempt there was an attempt but it didn't materialize uh, so when when we started this thought dog got triggered that do we need something like this ki kitna paisa chahiye because for me the debate started with matlab time immemorial 
there was a six percent figure came into position. Um, if I am my memory is correct, then Kothari Commission talked about that six percent, and we are still taking the uh, you know same uh, demand forward till date. I mean, it could be two percent, it could be four percent, it could be twenty percent. I mean, let's first come to a figure where we are saying, what do we need? And the first step was, um, you know, when we read philosophers and uh, I talked about education is like a passport to the future. And if it's passport to the future and we want to be future ready, then the best thing is to invest right and give children a right start. And that's what Save the Children is advocating for. Give children a right start by investing early. And as part of this Save the Children, wh when we look at the, our, our global strategy or national strategy, we have a sizable focus not only on the early learning, like Ms. Arup, you said about the, about the curriculum piece, about the, uh, ensuring that there's a demand from parents or what we say responsive caregiving at home to access to you know, many areas. So we talk about five pillars. But recently, we added one more pillar which talks about financing and policy initiative because this this, cycle, this circle cannot get completed if we don't talk about financing because some provisioning. And as you said about the standardization, that if standardization or universalization we need to talk about, we need to have an, a proper argument with government or with, with, with parents that we need this much of resource and, and we all need to advocate for that. So this was the um, you know beginning. We in Save the Children we started working on early years proper proper early uh, intervention six and a half years back, and we we created certain models uh, like any other NGO. Uh, that's uh, I mean at at that point of time the uh, the NGOs w w or or the or the CSOs were, were 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 custodian of creating models, and government is to scale it up. So we also you know, started working on it. We had curriculum, we had um, working with parents in institutions, Anganwadi, we, we, and a lot of mobilization that happened. Um, and so there was this, this, this knowledge which got generated uh, from us. And on the basis of that knowledge, um, in, in um, you know, in 2018, uh, building on Professor Vinita Kaur's study of, on longitudinal study, we started talking about financing models. Our aim was that we will costing, karenge, but we were not a like we were not economists and we, we had no idea, we were uh, So when we made TOR, banaya, we said we will cost the models, but we ended up only doing the financial models. So the first step was done and uh, we created those uh, financial models. It was like a recipe, just a sabzi ki recipe, hoti hai ki what would it take to make a good early learning education piece and we also came up with six models and uh, then the next step was it was a tough journey in the sense to talk about how do we that then now you know put a number against it because there were multiple reasons people start expecting from you you know uh, our community you have financial models to kiya par uska aage kya kiya matlab uska hum kya kare kahan leke jaye but this was an important step and we call that study Right Start Study. Luck would have it. Uh, we had um, for that study chairperson of Niti Ayo coming in, joining the uh, you know uh, the summit, and um, he took it forward. And as a result of it, some conversation started happening in Niti Ayo on ECE. Or kabi khichdi tha, matlab it was ECE, kabi ECD, kabi ECCE. And I think we still uh, enjoy that uncleared kind of a discussion when that happens. Because sometimes you have to invite to talk about ECE, what do you do to talk about ECE, what do you do to talk about So we are, like, we are taking this in our stride. Because like you said, way back in 1990s, we talked about universalization of elementary education. And it has taken us so many years. So, so we are prepared for that um, you know, uh, journey and uh, relishing it. So that w that's what happened from right start to, to our cost of universalizing early childhood education in India. 
So this is a step. And I would also like to state that this is just a conversation which we are putting in front of large public. So it's not something which is cast in stone. This is not something that people are saying that this is the bestest kind of study which is available to talk about, you know, what would it cost to do early learning in India? No, nothing like that. It's just the idea is all CSOs, all organization who have stake in this area and people who have actually fought for it. So once when I see uh, Devika ji still holding the stick and coming for the alliance meeting, I mean, that was the passion. So we are, I mean, if we are all in for it, we are game for it, then I think that the lesson which we learned that if we build on the pieces which people have done over a period of time, it's going to result into, um, you know, something which is a little more sensible. So uh, what I learned and what, you know, Shubrit is here, what we learned during the process, collaboration. People coming together with their own strengths and, and, and ideas. And I think it's more about thinking piece. It's more about discussing it. It's more about, you know, talking. Uh, so I would, so that's my learning. That's my learning is let's talk more. Let's discuss more. And um, let's collaboratively do a, you know, bigger kind of pieces, what was suggested by, by the speakers. Even if we have to talk about CES, we need to have a rationale. We need to ensure that how do we prioritize, even if we talk about advocacy pieces. So I think that's my lesson learned. And um, this is an, um, and I think, I, I pick up that line from you, Ms. Arup, it's time for an idea. It's for time for an idea to grow. And I think, um, but doesn't stop here. We need to move on and uh, not move on. Move on is not, not the right word. We need to go further and take some steps. So I think um, from Save the Children side, um, we are taking this initiative and taking this to uh, demand side. So ensure that de people demand for right kind of uh, education. We are, we are taking this study to the Alliance. Uh, we, are taking, we, are, we are also in the process of formulating a technical working group on early learning and um, see how collaborators work together and this is a journey thank you so much this is so yes i'm quite excited uh, thank you so much kamal and as you were speaking and as i heard everyone as a campaigner for me it feels like it's the beginning of a movement uh, with allies for children who can come together and build the road for future uh, with that, I would like to uh, invite Provita, uh, Pratiba Kundu. It's a Bengali name. It's a tongue twister. So I didn't get the pronunciation right. Uh, so Pratiba, uh, who has also worked, uh, who is a se sector thematic lead at CBGA, and also brings the experience of having worked at National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. So welcome, Pratiba. Uh, and we would deep dive into what the report has to offer for all the audience here, so that we can yeah, findings of the report, critical findings. Yeah, and I have um, Sorry, one second. I think it will have a password. Sorry, I was calling it Pratibha. <laughs> it's the hidden <laughs> background. Pratibha, <laughs> yeah.
Iya. Uh, while we wait for Pratibha to share the findings of the report, we're just waiting for the technical person so it projects for everyone. It's just, just like early childhood education taking time to start. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, as I mean, four of
talks about 0 to 6 year where the care component is quite strong whereas early childhood education is for 3 to 6 years and in our study we specifically focused on 3 to 6 years old children. Now let me start with some statistics. I mean these are all very known factors but still need to be revisited. Uh, there are 99 million children 3 to 6 years age group and if we talk about ECE provisions then three kinds of service providers are there, government, private entities and NGOs and government is the largest service providers where uh, we get the government provides ECE provisions through Anganwadi centers and pre primary school attached to its schools. Now Anganwadi centers again is the Sec, the, the most the biggest chunk of the government service provision and there Anganwadi centers are catering 27 million children for preschool education. So we have 99 million children and 27 million children are getting education through Anganwadi centers and government run pre-primary sections in government and government aided schools 2.9 million children are enrolled. There is another table that the challenge is we don't get adequate data for the private sector. We really don't know what is happening in terms of enrollment in the private sectors or NGOs because there is data gap. So this is one of the reports by Asher. They have tried to capture what is happening in the rural India. And then again we can see for each of the age group what is the status in terms of enrollment and what percentage of children are not in preschool. So for example for th uh, three three years old 28.8 percent are not in preschool and so on. The another question another uh, way which uh, I mean government is providing uh, early childhood education is I mean co there are Anganwadi uh, school centers co-located in within primary schools. Again a statistics shows that around 20 percent 28 percent of all government and government aided schools in India have Anganwadi centers co-located within their premises. At the same time, 20% of all government and government aided schools in India have pre-primary sections. So these are the given statistics in terms of the presence of early childhood education uh, provided by public government. So besides the physical indicators, some other factors is which is very important, one of the important questions for provisioning of early childhood education is financing. So the question now is why we have done this costing exercise, why it, is, it was required. Because the literature shows that all the ECE institutions, those are highly underfunded and that's why quality is also compromised. Of course there is no disaggregated budget data, it's very difficult to find out. I mean we really don't know how much government currently is spending on ECE. The current ECE system is, uh, is a patchwork, there are so many constituencies, the financing pattern is different, funding streams are different. But when we look at the policy framework, the National Early Childhood, uh, Early Childhood Care and Education Policy or recently National Education Policy or our commitments towards sustainable development goals, everywhere we are talking about universalization of early childhood education and there is also a time frame by 2030. So looking at this unevenness in terms of coverage, in terms of quality, we feel there is actually a need for preparing a responsive and uh, quality model where the, the it will provide the equity, there should be equity in the provision of uh, early childhood education. And for that, an estimation, accurate estimation is required because providing quality EC needs there is need for efficient planning, budgeting and then we can have an effective implementation at the ground. So from there we have approached this study. So the larger objectives of the study is simple. First is finding out the cost of running a quality responsive ECE model for providing early childhood education. Second is the larger goal to estimate the total budgetary allocation or total resource required to uh, bring all the children or provide EC provision to all the three to six year children. And finally, to calculate the gap, that is the present allocation and what is required so that we can make some evidence-based demand for, I mean, to show that wha what is the 
level of shortfall in terms of provisioning of EC. Uh, before again uh, uh, going to the methodology, we just want to say that it's a very, I mean, we have tried a very simple and honest approach towards costing. It's not very uh, something very difficult or fancy, but uh, we have tried a simple process to measure actually to get an idea how much resource would be required, uh, what is the need for the sector. So, uh, going to the costing part, first we need to know what is the present situation in terms of government financing of EC in India. So, two questions have been as asked, what is the overall resource envelope for the country and then the pattern of allocation for EC across states. Now, since we know that uh, child child related expenditure largely education is part of concurrent list so you see includes expenditure by both union government and state governments again as we see that ec as a multi sectoral approach it's not only about readiness for pre, i mean school but more about the cognitive development some kind of uh, uh, the the development of skills so that there is a lifelong uh, uh, I mean, a development of children in future or uh, lifelong development of a children. So that's why it's a multi-sectoral approach and many departments are responsible for uh, for in this process. Now, of course, we all, all know about Ministry of Women and Child Development, but this there is Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, then Ministry of Rural Development, Ministry of Urban Development, for example, the, the, the uh, through Narega, their schools are getting built so that's why all these departments are very much responsible for providing resources towards EC. and if we look at the schematic level then uh, integrated child development scheme run by ic and um, by mwcd and samagra siksha abhijan by minister of education these are basically the two major schemes through which uh, we, uh, ec is being provided so we have looked at all these departments, their pattern of uh, spending, how they are allocating uh, funds for which components, uh, component wise, what is the pattern of uh, allocation and spending and the scope of the studies of course all 30 states and for all the 3 to 6 years children. Now taking all this into account, what we see from our calculation we found that India is currently spending 0.1% of GDP on early childhood education. Now again if we look at if an international comparison be done, you can see that many other countries actually are spending much higher on EC component. Though we all I mean have uh, learned that the in through policy we have seen that so much importance is being given to EC, but that is not much supported by resources. In fact, in the OECD countries, the average spending on EC is 0.7% uh, of GDP. This calculation has been done for 21, 2021. So, if we convert this 0.1% of GDP, then in terms of public expenditure center and state together, it was coming out as 0.4% of total public expenditure was going for school education, uh, sorry, it's for early childhood education. What does it, uh, what does it imply in terms of part part student expenditure? And if we look at the across states, what is the pattern? Around, I mean, the all India average is eight thousand to eight thousand two hundred fifty seven rupees per student is being spent for uh, early childhood education, and the, it varies across states. So this is the current status. Now, fewer things that needs to be talked about. So when we looked at NEP, before the final NEP we got, there was on draft NEP where we got some kind of financial roadmap there, they have suggested some uh, resource requirement and there even there they have mentioned that 1.4% uh, of the total government expenditure is required every year for universalization of VCE. I mean almost, I mean existing situation, uh, I mean on the existing scenario, 1.4% recurring cost they are talking about and 0.6% as one-time investment. Now, in the last two years, there was pandemic. We have seen that there is so many fault lines in terms of public provisioning. So probably that would be, I mean, the requirement could be more, but at least there is need for more resources. But the problem is NEP 2020 was silent on financing. 
so that is again one of the i mean that is one of the trigger point to look at this study so what we do as i mentioned a very simple methodology we have used first looking at different uh, policy framework the mwcd uh, guidelines for quality the national early childhood education policy uh, ecc curriculum looking at all different kinds of policy existing policy frameworks we have identified the components which are critical for quality early childhood education first we have identified those components then we have tried we have assigned unit cost for each of the components and uh, how we derive the unit cost i will probably, uh, i'll give an example but based on our primary level survey and secondary research we came to that point then based on this i mean unit uh, the quality components and unit co uh, quality components we designed three ideal models which could be scale up for provisioning ec in the country as a next step after identifying what is what could be an ideal responsive ec center we have also calculated some cost at the aggregate level that is systemic cost or institutional uh, cost related for administration monitoring and institutionalization and then together we finally estimate the cost for universalization of ece the in the the components the quality components that we have identified and the budget head um, that the table is showing those for example salary salary of teachers center heads or supervisors helper anganwadi workers caregivers and other staff training of teachers and so on so the broader heads are salary training incentive educational material health nutrition monitoring curriculum infrastructure related cost community participation and fixed assets so these are the components we have identified now the next stage was uh, yeah so then as i as uh, we all know that there are different service providers so we have tried to gather information for all kind of service providers uh, like government where government again as i mentioned anganwadi centers and pre primary sections within government school then in the private entities the uh, ec service is, uh, is going through pre primary sections within private school or stand alone private pre school and then again ngo ngo run ec centers some are day care models and some are uh, running uh, only the ec uh, ec center so we have collected data from different uh, service providers and 14 was our sample and what is the this was basically uh, the sampling proce procedure was a purpose is sampling and what was the uh, logic behind choosing this i mean uh, this this uh, institutions or this centers first those have been chosen who have capacity to scale up where there is popular popular practices among service providers where those organizations are evaluate that their practice evaluated regularly and are known to be give, providing desired results and we have tried to present a geographical uh, distribution from i um, mean institutions from all the uh, part of the uh, countries and rural urban aspects also and finally those who, who are also willingness to share financial data and two kinds of information we have gathered from them and for that we prepared two two tools tool one was more about structured questions about the uh, uh, organizations uh, and we have uh, we have asked all the organizations to uh, give in uh, provide information for their model ec center and so the tool one is more about the uh, organization and tool two is relating to different expenditure or uh, data for academic years for the three years uh, on different uh, components now this is uh, based on those informations we have calculated the operational and establishment cost for all these uh, all these centers and you can see is of course it's varying uh, though these are not comparable because data was not similar for all the uh, centers but it it gives us some idea that how the per child operational cost varies it gives an idea that how unequal is the Uh, current system i mean uh, system or institutions which are providing ece now as i was mentioning how we were 
uh, appearing in different co the assigning unit cost for each of the components it's just an example training of teachers so we have uh, gathered uh, data for training per year per teacher in different right kinds of centers so we, what we try to offer is two cost one is that coming from some good practices or from this model the other one was based on the existing norms in different programs if that is providing some good results so our that's why you can see we have offered always a range of costs because nothing can be i mean unique so the first range is coming from our models and the second one here we have applied the norms which is existing under samagra shiksha vision where uh, they are talking about the financial norm for uh, for in, in service teacher training as well as induction training so in this way for all components we have identified a cost range one could be we can say feasible one could be optimal i mean nothing optimal but we can say that now looking at the nep when we looked at nep nep has given so much emphasis emphasis on early childhood care and care and education it's talking about long term financing strategy and that's why how this could be ec could be provided they have uh, suggested four platforms these are that stand alone anganwadi uh, centers pre schools pre primary school sections and anganwadi centers co located within primary schools now following our looking at the models the the primary survey we did looking at the secondary data exist and how nep is the recommendations we have we had proposing three modules we have basically designed three models first one is a stand alone preschool come daycare center this model would be suitable for urban areas and for children where both parents are working the it would work for 6 to 8 hours uh, the costing we di we did again the unit cost capacity 60 children teacher child ratio should be 1 is to 2 20 similarly we have costed for the another model we are proposing is stand alone anganwadi center and third one is pre primary sections in primary schools now on i mean that the model we derived the way we designed then assigning the unit cost on the quality components we identified we see that per child operational cost in this three proposed models are in this pattern it varies from 32500 in stand alone anganwadi centers this is the lowest one to 56300 in stand alone preschool come daycare center now these costs are at the center level and mostly operational cost but there are some costs which need to be decided at the aggregative le aggregative level so the programmatic cost related to ec service some of the examples that we have taken in our analysis national level for example cost required to strengthen the ncert is ec sale an assessment of preschool educational program across state state level components creating ec sel within ec sc ert training of ec coordinators and uh, need for mis because there is no such database exist so at the same time district level brc level some of the important uh, uh, people are uh, required for administration and monitoring need to be in place and we have calculated those costs in our study so taking both the operational cost uh, at the center level and this uh, aggregated level and systemic cost we are we have finally calculated the cost of universalization of ece so the first case if we are going to provide ece for all the 99 million children then it ranges from 1.5 to 2.5% of gdp now of course uh, the uh, and one two things here to share uh, it's always the case that not all children i mean universalization doesn't mean 100% children are uh, having uh, going for public provisioning if we even ask government to provide the services uh, we have seen from the nss recent nss data that uh, around 6% of the top 10% income class are actually always uh, i mean 3 to 6 years are preferably going to private schools i mean this 6% can never be go to public school probably so uh, universalization means 90% to 95% of children that is one of the things and as madam uh, kavita ma'am said that yes of course uh, i mean one can argue that while while we are not getting 6% of gdp 
another 2%. And even when Kothadi Commission was calculating, they talked about 2% of GDP. I mean, the, the fact is, when we are calculating, they were calculating primary education, there was also some foundation. But you see, we can see there is no foundation. We don't know, there is no standardized norms. So we need to, I mean, take into, when we are measuring, we should talk about each quality components. I mean, and if not, we are getting at a, I mean, for that, I mean, it's not a one-time, one-time uh, expenditure or investment government can do. It, it can be done in a phased manner. So this is one of the things, but we shouldn't, I mean, uh, we should talk about all the quality components required for uh, equitable ECE service. The second case is, uh, if we want to provide ECE to children who are not availing government ECE services. Now we have seen that around 68% uh, children, yeah, uh, those who are uh, not going to government schools, but either pri going to private or NGOs or not having any, taking any, I mean, going for any ECE services, then the cost will appear like that. And the third case, if we only focus on who are currently not any not attending any ECE services, if we immediately if we really want to bring all the children in the system, then the it cost range from 0.5 percent of GDP to 0.9 percent of GDP. So this is the additional resource required for the uh, universalization of ECE. Now again, one point needs to be keep in mind if we really want to go for this model, the 0.1 percent GDP of GDP that is existing, of course that is not giving us quality because the, all the qualitative norms are not being maintained. So for improving that we need some additional resources, but at least to start the procedure, uh, start the process, 0.5 percent of GDP, uh, 0.5 to 9 would be required. Uh, so based on this study, some of the broad conclusions. Of course, one is very, I mean, sh uh, clearly coming out that we need for more resources, at least uh, to reach up to 0.5 percent of GDP. Uh, a mechanism is required. Uh, we have now NEP implementation plan that is called SARTHAK. They have highlighted so many points uh, on how we are achieving the goals. Where they are talking about by 2021, there should be a mechanism to monitor fund flow and make uh, utilization, and I think that should be. Uh, that that process should be implemented immediately, no, not still, I mean the process has started but still not in place for ECE. Conducting a sectoral analysis is very important because we really don't know much about the ECE sector. I mean the, all the education uh, discussion starts from primary uh, class one. So a sectoral analysis is required and uh, the need is more we have felt when we were doing this analysis that the lack of data. I mean, both physical as well as financial and disaggregated level data. I mean, whatever available, probably at the national level or some at state level. But the, uh, if we go down district level, school level, what is happening, we really don't know. Even uh, DICE, recent DICE is not giving uh, data on how many pre-primary uh, schools are uh, providing, I mean, have this uh, ECE provision or how many co-located Anganwadis are there. The previous dies are giving us those data, but recent dies is not providing that data. Uh, this discussion, uh, the Brinda ma'am has talked about, and in our report, we have a detailed discussion about the need for professionally qualified regular cadre workforce to ensure quality EC. Since there is no standardization in terms of qualification, though uh, MWCD is talking about the, the guideline is talking about uh, the the need for quality uh, qualified teacher, but there is no such uh, norms followed. There is no standardization of uh, the salary, which is uh, I mean, which is a I mean very big concern in terms of how you actually for which platform you want to use and how you want to uh, you want to uh, ensure the quality is easy for all if you are not maintaining these aspects. The, the other thing is uh, training and monitoring is very important and uh, I mean I, I'm not going into the all detail uh, recommendation related to that because that we have mentioned in our, on, on our, in our report but this is important. Need to set up standardized financial norms for select components at the central level. Now, now the thing is since we have heterogeneous population, 
the diversity geographical uh, geographical diversity is there so we really uh, can't say standardize everything at central level but for teacher salary like curriculum this needs to be standardized at central level and there should be flexibility for states to design it to add it or modify it in terms of the uh, the local and specific context need they should work on that but then need to be something centralized uh, it's in terms of financial norms then some of the components exist unit cost of those those components associated to ec interventions now there for a longer period period of time i um, mean stagnant there is need for upward revision these are not inflation index that needs to be looked at uh, because many a time it happens because of the poor uh, unit cost states are not utilizing managers they are surrendering the resources and uh, it's, it's giving a it's a vicious cycle then under utilization again leading, leading to under allocation uh, need for institution building uh, if training is required then we need to make a ec sale at diet we need to uh, recruit uh, uh, the trainers we need to build the institutions and most of the time every uh, the, the the components in ending up in in service training of teachers but the, for teacher training more what is more required is institutional building that part uh, most of the time uh, just we miss that part and finally ec programs need to, need to be regulated there are sick, uh, service providers they don't follow the most of them the, they don't follow the uh, pedagogic uh, the, the curriculum suggested the mwcd norms nothing being followed and uh, so there is a need for uh, regulation uh, uh, at least at least uh, some kind of uh, non negotiable uh, i mean uh, no, non negotiable norms should be there to regularize all these service providers so uh, of course resource is a question and uh, some of the things we need to uh, start immediately so we have tried to find out some alternative sources through which ec can be financed within government setup uh because uh, i mean of course this is one of the questions that resource kahan se aayega so i mean these are very much existing not not very long term approach not sustainable talking about sustainable financing but some could be done is uh, if we look at the uh, finance sub, uh, uh, for sustainable financing we need to increase the gross budgetary support we need to increase the tax to gdp ratio but immediately uh, the finance come if we look at the finance commission's recommendations now uh, there is more flexi funds uh, states has some more additional re resources many of the states have additional resources which uh, in their hand so if they actually prioritize children if the priori prioritize early childhood education this could be one of the avenue and not for central finance commission even that is true for states finance commission uh this year again pipin uh, finance commission talked about sector specific grant where they are talking about uh, education sector so uh, i don't know how things would happen but ec could be one of the components if state wants uh, states want to uh, think of prioritizing it uh i was talking uh, we are talking about says but uh, not um, uh, i mean we not suggested for introducing any new says but there is so much unutilized says every time we see when we look at the cag reports even recently there was reported saying about about 40% of total says money collected is lying with the uh, consolidated fund of india so if we can use those unutilized says for uh, ec provisioning there is unspent balance under different programs under different schemes so we can there is a scope for reprioritizing within sectors within uh, uh departments even within schemes so that could be uh, we can think of that corporate social social responsibility is another avenue nep is talking about alternative financing and philanthropic financing csr now uh, csr if we look at the csr money actually csr money the large chunk goes for education and around if we look around 17% of uh, uh, recent calculation is there that 17% of csr money is going for education but if some part can go for early childhood education then at least the process could start thank you
Thank you so much, uh, Pratibha, for taking us through the key highlights and elements of the report. And with this, we are ready to unveil and offer this report and make it available to all of you to read, to come and collaborate with us to take the journey ahead for early education for every child in India. Uh, so could we request before, and we have a panel discussion, but before that, we would really want to formally launch the report, unveil it. Uh, so Priyanka, uh, come on. So if we could have all our panel members and speakers, guest speakers, uh, join us in front of the dais so that we can have a nice photo opportunity as well. So thank you, everyone. And with this, we move to the panel discussion. Uh, introducing our panel members, I would like to welcome Dr. Renu Singh, uh, who is the country director for Young Lives in India since 2010. And with nearly three decades of experience and in teaching experience in general, special education, teacher education, early childhood development, policy analysis, and research, both in India and overseas, uh, she also represents, she's representing uh, uh, she's represented as a member of Central Board of Secondary Education and working group for formulating for the N National Policy on Early Childhood Care and Education, uh, and so many more. So Dr. Renu, please welcome and join us for the panel discussion. Moving on, uh, Subrat Das. Uh, without CBGA, it wouldn't have been possible, this collaboration, so thank you so much. He is the executive director at CBGA and instrumental in forging this partnership and work with Save the Children to bring financing and children's concerns at the center. Uh, and Nam Kamal Gore. Kamal, you need no introduction. Please join us on the stage. And this panel will be moderated by our director of policy and program impact, uh, Dr. Namrata Jaitli. And we will be discussing what Sudarshan started with in his opening remark, that let's not look at it as a cost but investment, not as a burden, but the imperative need that the country we must make in the direction of early childhood education in India. Thank you. Over to you, Namrata. Can you hear me? Thank you so much, and uh, I think we've had quite a packed session uh, since since we've been there from two o'clock. But uh, this is such an important and an exciting uh, milestone, I would say, in India's journey that we are actually discussing this whole element of cost of universalizing early childhood education. So maybe uh, you know, uh, bear with us for this final, and and, and I'm telling you, it's going to be a very animated conversation <laughs> so so uh, thank you so much for joining this panel and uh, as uh, pragya said the focus of uh, the panel is universalizing quality ec in india investment not a cost so um, we have uh, three esteemed guests and uh, uh, i think what will be good is that we would try doing 
we'll try doing two rounds and we'll try making this more conversational because it will be like we said we are actually initiating a discourse a dialogue and uh, please be critical uh, and uh, i think what we are wanting out of the, at the end of this panel is not only the emphasizing the importance of uh, ece the importance of having a uh, you know having public investment on ece but also uh, ensuring that we have some roadmap some recommendations and some you know additional asks for the government for the civil society organizations and for the citizens at large so a, a, a tall you know um, order to cover in maybe another 40 minutes because i'm mindful of the time so may i'll i'll start with you kamal and uh, you know you kind of because uh, this whole conversation is situated uh, around this whole element that you know save the children along with uh, cbg has embarked on this study so what would be very uh, interesting is that uh, while we have kind of you know i do i will not go into this whole element of do we need to invest on ec because i think that is that is uh, we've kind of proven that it is an essential component if you have to really look at the foundational learning piece but what we would very be uh, interested to know kamal is that how from safe's perspective you know do you think that universalization of ece will contribute to strengthening the foundational uh, you know base for children of india so uh, just some some insights you did mention briefly about what safe but i think it will be good to just quickly some few uh, insights in terms of how Sa how safe sees this and why is safe you know um, you know trying to prioritize and focusing our uh, uh, you know uh, attention on this whole element of ece so i think thank you uh, first thing is we are child rights based organization and if we are not going to talk about this right then who else will be so collaborators like us and uh, as a as a as a member of child rights organization i think we should talk about it and that's one of the reasons why we talk about it second is uh, if we look at saves global or national strategy is very much part of it it's mm -hmm. center um, in india we are talking about that 50% of the investment in education will go to the sector so uh, that's a second piece mm -hmm. third piece is that if um, you know if any uh, if cso wants to be the thought leaders then probably they need to move not away but also include uh, you know uh, research and financing piece into it we we have been having this debate about the quality access piece but i think the next uh, step forward is we need to talk about it so that's that's another uh, uh, reason and over the last 6 years of work in this area and um, directly working in this area at the programmatic level one realized that at times it becomes a constraint like when when we work in uh, field setting there's so much we provide additional piece you know? whether it's a it's our uh, curriculum gulmohar and or it's the uh, training or capacity building of anganwadi workers or helpers uh, creating that learning environment in the in the at the center level or working with parents so i think when, when you realize that you have worked in this area so probably i think we are working as additionality so but but this needs to be made part of the public financing i mean because what we are talking about whenever, whenever we talk about universalization it's right based it's it's uh, every same for all so i think that's the pitch which i am uh, taking and a lot of convergence and collaboration so convergence not only at the what earlier the debate was at the ministerial level or but now convergence at the uh, at the collaborators level matlab jo hamare sath is players hain baki unke sath bhi convergence and collaboration ki baat hai that's another piece which interests me and uh, i think yes and also uh, we would like to uh, save the children we would like to build on this piece so we we are what we are planning is let's talk about fln completely and let's look at 0 to 8 years kind of an investment so do hisson mein ek to 0 to 3 years mein kya hona hai aur ek 3 se 8 saal ke bachcho ke liye kya provision so wo bhi interest hai that 
<laughs> you know we need we would like to take it further great i think thank you so much so this is from a civil society perspective and thanks for at least highlighting some of the elements which are save the children we have been trying to focus you know on on strengthening ece so i would now move on to you uh, first round uh, to you uh, in terms of uh, really, really understanding uh, renu that you know you've been uh, we know uh, we know of your work and this whole element of uh, you know the longitudinal study which you've done recently in the four countries and from from an from an academic and an evidence point of view it will be very interesting to understand that what has those studies you know shown in terms of having uh, you know highlighting the implications of ece on a long term basis you know what's the long term effect and i think there was some conversation which in the initial speakers also they did mention that you know you invest in ece for a long term so some insights from 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 a you know research and an evidence perspective yeah. so i think uh, uh can you hear me yeah okay i'm not sure this is working but maybe yeah. it feels this okay so uh just to say that um, you know we've been following two cohorts of 12000 children across four countries since 2002 just to give you a little bit of a background so these uh, there were two cohorts 8 year old and 1 year old uh, in ethiopia uh, vietnam peru and india uh, and now the 8 year olds are 28 and it's been almost 21 years since we've been doing the study and the one year olds are now going to be 19 uh, so we're going to the field next year we're just preparing for the next round of survey um, and it's very interesting too because we have data of their preschool education right so how mm -hmm. many attended what kind and of course all four countries are different contexts but i think the overriding learning we are seeing is that attending preschool itself Uh, at 28 you know you can see transitions into higher education you know you can do the correlations you can look at transitions we just in fact released a paper the, yesterday in a journal uh, in the indian journal of human development where we could see transitions into regular salaried employment right uh, and we could then correlate it with attending preschool and learning to read and write age appropriately at age 8 because that's the evidence you need for policy makers right uh so what is uh, and i'm going to give you some statistics which we got from india just to give you the indian piece so those who you know it's at there was significant at 10% level for those who transitioned into higher education with 40 almost 50% of those who attended preschools mm. transitioning into higher education right vis-a-vis -vis something like 39% for those who didn't yeah so you can see the difference uh, also and this is a pro poor sample so these are all poor families and we are not talking of middle class or rich families also very interestingly we looked at government and private right those what kind of preschool so of course private there's a huge difference and the kind of private preschools that our children went to were the low fee charging private schools none of them went to the elite right because this is a pro poor sample many of them said uh, i had to mortgage my bangles to be able to send my child to a a, pre, a, pre, a low fee charging uh, school that, that's the kind of you know you were talking of uh, people's aspirations but that's the kind of aspirations our families had and the fa and even with a single daughter she say i don't mind i won't give her bangles at my at her marriage i'd rather invest it in her education so you start sending the child to a low fee charging private uh, school which has a pre because earlier you didn't mm -hmm. have the kg class and we're talking of you know 2002 when this this was happening but you can see huge difference significance at 1% level 64.8% who went to private schools transition into higher education vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis 37% only went to government anganwadi you know you can see the difference mm -hmm. even in the low fee charging so i think the the, the big learning mm -hmm. is and we also asked the quality question at that time i remember round 1 from the parents so do you think the school that your child is going to is of good quality just to understand it and it's only based on perception of the parent so parental perception of quality and again we find significance at 1% level of for those who went you know who said the school was good quality vis-a-vis -vis those who said poor quality so even within the private school those who said low quality you had much less significantly less people transitioning into higher education mm -hmm. i'm giving you one small correlate right mm -hmm. just to say that there is enough evidence i don't think we should yes of course we need to present the evidence but i think what 
policy makers often when you go into a room and you talk to policy makers i've spoken to you ma'am very many times <laughs> and i know what i want to give you tell you this i you may have forgotten but if you remember when rte came in and i was fighting with you to say please add the preschool component you literally threw me out of the room <laughs> saying let me first deal with the elementary renu <laughs> stop it <laughs> and she said i said ma'am but you know we are going to get the money allocated to the steering committee and she said i can send the money back <laughs> i still remember that because because the the time was probably not right mm -hmm. i know but and here we are the ec champions say but you must you must push. sorry i'm saying this in a audience but i i just want to say it because i think today there is much more openness you know to saying this is critical and i remember you asking me one thing that time i don't know you have probably forgotten you said give me the value so for every rupee invested what is going to be the return that's what might mm -hmm. change things we didn't have the answer then i hope that's the mm -hmm. next thing we're going to do because mm -hmm. that's what policy the, the politician needs to hear for every rupee invested mm -hmm. you're going to get so i just uh, read um sunisha bor is doing review of researches done with unicef i just read a research report i'm re reviewing those from burundi there's a new paper from burundi which is saying for every dollar invested in burundi mm -hmm. and i'm giving this in comparison because it's you know it's, it's not a very developed country every dollar they've shown that 15 dollars is going to be the return mm -hmm. on investment and i think that's the sort of argument mm -hmm. we need to take forward today the, the politicians you have to have political will absolutely you know to be able to to use the evidence that you have and i'm so glad that you've got this evidence together but let's push the envelope further is all i would say thank you so i think you know that's excellent we were we were discussing that we don't really have enough evidence oh, we to actually long. you know really share long. longitudinal that what is the long term impact and if you, you invest on ec social skills we've also looked at things like measured grit of children mm. and i i was just thinking as you were speaking we can correlate mm. it to preschool education we've got self efficacy academic self concept we've got all these psychosocial you know skills that we are measuring subjective well being uh, so you can actually correlate it you know so the, the, in a longitudinal that's the whole value of a longitudinal study you know to be able to correlate this and present the evidence long term thank you so much so we'll we'll kind of you know broach this further in the second round and now over to you shubhrat so i know as you know cbg has been uh, you know really um, doing tremendous work when it comes to uh, you know emphasizing this whole element of uh, public investment so uh, while we've been hearing on you know there is a need but from your point of view you know why do you think that there is a need to prioritize public provisioning for ece when especially when there are such competing demands you know which we ourselves as civil society actors place on the government you know So, if you so from what would what would you be uh, you know what would you what would be your pitch if we had to kind of take this to the government? Why emphasize on ECE over you know the other pressing uh, issues of uh, you know social concern? Thanks, thanks, Namrata. And in the study, we have estimated what would be the resource requirement for public sector provisioning of ECE. Uh, being universalized mm -hmm. universalized provisioning of ece it doesn't mean that we actually believe that there is no role for private sector providers or non profit providers that's not the case but we are taking into account the advocacy which has been ongoing mm -hmm. uh, in the larger civil society for the right to uh, you know ecce and uh, i'll i'll share the example of how women and child development departments in different states have been budgeting for the supplementary nutrition program component of icds mm. there are some states that do budget for 90% to 100% coverage even when the bureaucrats know that not that many children are going to come mm. but what they have shared with us which we have always found very inspiring that how can a government not provision resources for all children who are eligible and not even aspire to cover mm. all children so even when uh, i'm not naming the states but but uh, one principal secretary of a wcd department said so i know that my department gets pulled up for unutilized funds but i will not feel comfortable in budgeting for anything less than say 90% mm -hmm. of the children who are eligible but there are states who do not budget for more than 60% of the eligible children 
giving just the opposite argument when we know that not even 50% of the children in the 6 months to 6 years age group are coming to Anganwadi centers, why do we expect us to allocate more than 60%? We will have unutilized funds and we will be pulled up by the finance mm -hmm. department. So in this spectrum, we decided to side with the rights-based organizations and, and uh, lend support to rights-based advocacy for ECE. Mm -hmm. And hence, we have estimated the resource requirement for public sector provisioning of universalized uh, mm -hmm. ECE. But obviously, uh, the fact is that once, and then to use uh, uh, Vrindaji's words, once this sector really opens up, the different types of provisioning will evolve. Mm -hmm. We can't really predict. I mean, the three models uh, that we have referred to, these are more these are not not the models that save the children and cbg are proposing mm. these are the models we are referring to for our exercise of arriving at certain numbers mm -hmm. and when it comes to public sector provisioning why i mean as i said the point is we, uh, we are not saying that everything should be provided by the government mm. uh, but yes the uh, costing exercise has taken mm. that approach in terms of the role of public sector provisioning, again to use uh, what Vrindaji said, if we want the criteria, I mean if we want ECE teacher criteria to be defined and standardized mm -hmm. or curriculum to be defined and standardized, I think the public sector needs to mm -hmm. step in more substantively and 40% of the children in the 3 to 6 age group are not accessing, not, not getting any ECE service right. at all that's the degree of extent of exclusion and 60 percent of the children who are getting ec services there is also a lot of disparity mm -hmm. in access and mm -hmm. quality the out-of-pocket expenditure varies from thousand rupees per child i guess it's per month mm -hmm. pratibha would be able to yeah. per year yeah. uh, yeah. sorry sorry so thousand rupees per child per uh, annum in the government schools to twelve thousand rupees per child per annum in the private schools mm. but Pratibha, the private sector preschool providers in Delhi uh, imply out of pocket expenditure of more than 1.5 lakh rupees. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it, it goes up to, so it's not just 13,000 rupees <laughs> per child per annum in the private sector, it can cross 1.5 lakh at least in Delhi. Okay. So that's the range mm. that we are witnessing. Uh, Obviously, as this sector grows, mm. as ECE service delivery grows, we'll have different types of models in different contexts. Mm. Uh, but, uh, you know, that initial, mm. I would say, uh, foundational investment in not just in terms of resources, but in terms mm. of different mm. aspects mm. of the sector and the service have to come from the government. That's the perspective. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think we... we echo that in terms of uh, you know the government cannot abdicate their responsibility especially on a sector and the fact that civil society has been you know uh, pushing uh, for, for this whole element on uh, you know prioritizing ECE so very quickly now because we said we will not only discuss the challenges and the need but what is it that we need to do and as you know as as because I, all of us are representing the civil society here uh, so uh, I'll start with you, Kamal. You know, and we've talked about uh, this whole element of, you know, the whole element of inequity in India. You know, and in w within Save also, we've really talked about focusing on the most vulnerable and marginalised children. So, uh, and I'm sure the 37 percent who are not accessing ECE at all, uh, you know, definitely will be will be from the from the vulnerable and the marginalised section. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. seeing this diversity. Uh, uh, you know what? What would be uh, what? What would you recommend from your experience as a viable strategy to universalize, uh, you know, equitable ECE services, quality EQ. You know, it's not only you know it's not only access, but quality ECC service, ECE services. So, uh, if I draw a parallel to the universalization of elementary education, right? What was the approach? So there, there are players like government, if we are mm. talking about universalization, the, uh, the, the way we work. So it's like mission mode kind of an approach which we need to look into. It. Second is that, as, as Shubhrat said, the, the basic minimum standards need to be provided 
by the by the um, you know a, or you can say a framework uh, for three to six years old to be provided by the government and then there is a freedom by, uh, of state to you know add things to it mm -hmm. so the uniformity in terms of certain basic standards needs to be maintained those norms need to be maintained but over and above it's if, if you have resources go ahead but um, the at the at the concept level as well as at the minimum provisioning kind of a level so i think that's the uh, 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 responsibility and that the then then uh, as the sector will evolve because mm -hmm. the ye to abhi conversation jaise shuruaat ho rahi hai Five six years back, मतलब ज़्यादा conversation शुरू हुआ. So as the things will evolve, as what Shubhra said, there'll be many more models, mm -hmm. right? But एक तो यहाँ पे conversation, uniform framework की बात है, और एक और जो I think national and state government need to bond the expense. कुछ formula जैसे जब हम DPP में थे तो reducing basis पे spend की बात थी तो 85 परसेंट से शुरू हुआ और फिर बोला कि 85 परसेंट सेंटर दे रहा है बाकी स्टेट mm -hmm. देगा और धीरे धीरे चीज़ रिड्यूस करने की बात थी तो कुछ मतलब अभी कोई डेफिनेट सोल्यूशन तो नहीं है पर उस तरीके का भी डिस्कशन बिकॉज वी नीड टू लर्न आर लेसन फ्रॉम एलिमेंट्री एजुकेशन 20 साल 25 साल इन्वेस्ट mm -hmm. करने के बाद अगर हम वी आर नॉट एबल टू अचीव स्टूडेंट लर्निंग आउटकम तो जो वहाँ पे गैप्स हैं प्रॉबेबली दैट वी नीड टू लुकिंग that's that's a very valuable point and i take you know i take away the mission mode and at least minimum standard you know equitably to ensure that at least you know equitably you have ensure access uh, of the ec services to all the children uh moving on to you uh you know renu and you've been part of the working group of uh, the ece policy formulation and also when the quality standards were being set so uh now that you know we've talked about the new education policy and the fact that that was a big win you know that at least we've got the new education policy talking about uh, you know ecc uh, what according to you you know uh, would be your perception in terms of how uh, what is the state of preparedness of india to actually roll out the ece component which is stated in the new education policy especially uh, you know keeping into account um, uh, so one is what is the you know what's the level of preparedness and what would be your recommendation more in terms of because there has been a conversation around this whole element of do we have you know trained resources mm -hmm. human resources to be able to you know uh, ensure that quality ece is transacted so in that what would what are the some key uh, considerations which government of india needs to keep in mind uh, you know in terms of really looking at the human resource element and also how can quality be you know uh, assessed in terms of uh, not only uh, the assessment element of uh, the ec but also what are the outcomes so some some recommendations or way ahead which we can then you know actually put in in the form of some concrete recommendations to the government in terms of effective operationalization of mm -hmm. a critical aspect which is there in the policy i think um, in terms of preparedness i think the political economy today definitely uh, is more fertile for early childhood education to be given more priority i think the conversations have already started even before while the nep was being drafted the ecc policy um, you know uh, unfortunately never really saw the light of day because mwcd was giving nutrition the push so every time we went back to go we were part mm -hmm. of the working group and we went back to the ministry to say why is it this because we made quality standards they you know mm -hmm. we were we were supposed to get a second anganwadi worker but you needed all the resources mm -hmm. for this to happen and we were told no nutrition is being given the big push you know so i think it's it's mm -hmm. also very important that we look at the political economy when when we are looking at preparedness for mm -hmm. roll out mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know i love what you said that let's do it in a mission mode so to make that mm -hmm. happen i think they we need to a i think we we, we shouldn't be uh, you know rushing things under the carpet because i think we need to know whose baby is ec i think <laughs> <laughs> you know to keep saying okay so you know uh, the business rules happened and mwcd took took on the role so now we've got foundational learning and actually when we talk on investing in e ece it should be 3 to 6 it should be 3 to 8 mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. all the time we keep saying why are we saying 3 to 6 so we 
Now, it's the, the reason we are saying 3 to 6 is because of the ministry. Mm. Right? That's the reason. Uh, but let's not push it under the carpet. Let's have that dialogue right out there in the open. You know, and it's, it, it's of course it's not, it's contentious. Of course it's getting into areas which is not comfortable for people to discuss. But I think it's very important because <laughs> I think if we don't have, you know, accountability, it will, we'll keep having, so you're talking of these models, standalone models, one model located mm -hmm. in a primary school. I just went to see a, lo a, pre a, a, a school in Gurgaon the other day where uh, the Anganwadi center had just come in, in this new academic session, into a, a school, um, a primary school. And to my horror, I saw the stove, the gas stove, mm -hmm. in the same room. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they don't have an allo space yeah. allocated for a kitchen. So the children were in the same room as where the food was being cooked. I mean, absolutely a safety hazard. And and when I asked, I said, what? And and the, so the lady said, Isko to aap chhod dijiye, main to so in fact, the principal of the, the main school which looked after this primary school was also with me. She said, ja ke kitchen mein dalo na isko. She said, nahi la sakte, ration kaise dal sakte apna wala wahan pe. <laughs> you know, we have, th these, are the, these are the issues on the ground, right? And then the Anganwadi worker tells me, ab achha, khana ko to chhod dijiye, hum dekh lenge. She said, ye tis bachche mere jo migrant workers ke the, wo nahi aa rahe. वो उनकी झुग्गियों में रह रहे हैं वो सड़क पे रह रहे हैं क्योंकि अब उनके पास आधार नहीं है सो द क्वेश्चन इज आई डोंट थिंक वी कैन टॉक अबाउट यूनिवर्सलाइजिंग एनीथिंग अनलेस वी डील विद द मेन फैक्ट्स अबाउट हु इज अकाउंटेबल वेयर इज दिस गोइंग टू बी बेस्ड बिकॉज अदरवाइज वी गोइंग टू कॉन्स्टेंटली बी ट्राइंग टू फिगर दिस आउट and we i think debates have happened for a long time but i think we we should bring the center stage so you know when ma'am said nct doesn't have a mandate below grade 1 yeah but now whose mandate is this nipsit definitely cannot be right so then who is <laughs> sorry so <laughs> where, who who on earth is going to take the responsibility for this so mm. i think we need to be i think we need convergence and dialogue between the different ministries before anything else will happen. Financing will come, but let's have that discussion. And then, of course, you know, it comes to whether, you know, you know I saw, you know, you were talking about in, in the, the policy brief, talking about bringing up the wages to 43,000 or mm -hmm. something, right? Mm -hmm. Now, hello, the qualifications have to also meet. Are we getting rid of all the Anganwadi workers? No, we can't. So are we going to imagine somebody who's getting what on paper is still 6,000 or 8,000. Are we going to bring it to 43,000? Who on earth is going to do that? No amount of what in-service training we do. So I would question this. So are we do we believe a new cadre should be made? Sure. But then, you know, you also, so I think we need to really take the stock of and crash, crashes are absolutely critical. In mm -hmm. Peru, we have this program called Baba Vasi. You all should read it. You know, even on our website, we have some evaluations of that. We, you know, we supported the government in Peru to do us, uh, these Baba Vasi centers where the mothers are the helpers. They, they are the ones who are trained to be the main workers in, the, in these Baba Vasi centers. And you should see the Tehran community kitchens. Every child is diagnosed for what nutritional needs the child needs, right from a two month old so right from two months, the child can come in. So there are babies in cradles. The older yeah. ones are playing. You know, they, they have a place to sleep. The mothers, some of them are working. They take turns. There's community ownership. So I mean, one of the critical things in universalizing ECC or ECE, whatever you might call it, is partnerships with communities and parents. Mm -hmm. And we, ha we need to really build on that. So I think so two, two important points. Convergence, whose baby is it? <laughs> <laughs> Even if it's not one single ministry's baby, you know, how do you have systems to have more effective convergence? This whole element of community ownership, I think that's extremely critical. And again, you're re-emphasizing on this whole important component of, you know, having st standard qualification frameworks for, you know, ECC educators, whether it's Anganwadi workers and then maybe the financial element. You know, we had slipped in and uh, the ministry somehow didn't notice it and agreed to tracking every child. We've got it in the policy document. You have a look at it. We managed to slip it in. 
But, <laughs> but guess what? Nothing's happening. Let somebody ask the question, what's happening? Then I think in India, the, you know, all, of, all of us will agree that we've got great legislations and policies. I think uh, where we tend to falter a bit is in terms of its effective implementation. So over to you, Shubhrat. In terms of because the fact that we are really looking at, you know, universalization of ECC uh, in terms of the financial aspects. So uh, though we did talk about and there is a recommendation in your study also, but what according to you are possible avenues for resource mobilization? And, uh, and also, if you could throw some light on the 15th Finance, uh, you know, uh, Finance Commission recommendations, and also the center state sharing of fiscal responsibilities. So, I mean, when I'm thinking of uh, mobilizing resources, I'm not thinking of that two percent of GDP figure, mm. because that's uh, not an amount that's uh, going to be allocated right away. Mm. I don't think. Uh, you know, uh, we are uh, urging the government to start by allocating 2% of GDP mm -hmm. in a year, center and states combined. Uh, it's not possible and uh, that kind of resources cannot be absorbed on the ground. Right. So it's something which will mm -hmm. take some time uh, and, and uh, but a beginning has to be made mm -hmm. and obviously it has to be far bigger an amount than the 0.1% of GDP mm -hmm. uh, which the center and the states are spending Currently together right yeah. now. Now on CES, I completely agree with Professor Kavita Rao, CES <laughs> is a little contentious. Mm. So on the positive side, CES finds immediate traction with the political leaders. I mean that's what we mm. f see because they see, you know, just as philanthropists want to see direct social impact for their <laughs> money, yeah. I guess our leaders also want to see direct impact and purpose for which the money is being collected, maybe uh, it's easier for them to justify the imposition of uh, a levy by the government. But there are two contradictions, there are two problems with mm. CES. One is what our experience shows over the last two decades, usually a CES is introduced to supplement resources for a sector. Mm. that the budget is providing X amount of mm. money, X amount of resources to a sector, the introduction of the CES is justified on the ground that the resources will become 1.25x. Mm. You will get 25% more and that 25% supplementary resources are going to come from the CES. Mm. But experience of education CES shows that it ends up substituting, mm. not supplementing ah. the resource provisioning. Mm. So then that 0.25x grows bigger, but that x disappears. Mm. So then the sector is confined to what you're getting from the CES. Mm. So tax financing is always preferable than this kind of CES financing. Uh, secondly, states do not receive any proportion of the money that the center receives from imposing CESs and surcharges. Mm. So from the fiscal federalism perspective also, it is a contentious mm. issue. Uh, however, since the 14th and 15th Finance Commission recommendations have increased the proportion mm -hmm. of untied funds within the central mm -hmm. transfers to states, uh, the Union Ministry of Finance does have a preference for imposition of CES. Mm -hmm. So this will remain a contentious issue for the advocates of ECE, whether mm -hmm. to push for a CES or not, CES will find better traction. Uh, especially with government of India, not, not the states, uh, but public finance experts will always argue for tax financing. Now on tax financing, that's, uh, I think that's a very difficult question. So two of our former finance minister, uh, when Mr. Chidambaram was the finance minister in UPA 2, and then late Mr. Mm -hmm. Arun Jaitley as mm -hmm. finance minister in India 1, both have used the same phrase in the budget speech to comment on India's tax GDP ratio. They said India's tax GDP ratio is low for a large developing country, mm. which is true. It is low for a large developing country, but increasing the tax GDP ratio, as uh, Professor Kavita Rao knows far better than anyone else in the room, it's, it's not that easy, it's difficult. Mm. And uh, I don't know how much scope is there for increasing the tax GDP ratio through improvement in tax administration. Uh, but when it comes to changes in tax policy, that's really difficult because 
we can't really be asking for more taxes to be collected from indirect taxes already mm-hmm. india's tax system is heavily dependent on gst on indirect mm-hmm. taxes direct taxes need to contribute more but within that uh, to find that kind of political will to talk about uh, higher corporate uh, tax rates or uh, uh, you know to talk about wealth tax inheritance tax or taxes in the financial services sector that's not an easy proposition uh, but the fact is india's tax gdp ratio is indeed low for a large developing country so that's not uh, uh, you know something which is uh, which has easy solutions uh, in terms of the finance commission grants i would say that uh, whether the i mean yes on the revenue collection side mm-hmm. things have become a lot more centralized uh, despite the structure of the gst council it is the center mm-hmm. the government of india which determines revenue collection to a much greater extent uh, and the states are dependent on central mm-hmm. transfers to a greater extent now uh, but in terms of the spending priorities or mm-hmm. the expenditure decisions it is true that the proportion of central transfers which the states get as untied funds mm-hmm. has increased significantly during the 14th and the 15th finance commission period so now the states have more autonomy in terms mm. of deciding their spending priorities uh, and we should expect the state governments to value investing in ece a lot more than investing mm. in concrete infrastructure kind of development uh, uh, you know a, a policy maker from maharashtra had said it in a meeting a few years ago that most chief ministers want to see concrete infrastructure led development mm. so It's what visible. professor rao <laughs> said roads so mm-hmm. what it means is roads flyovers airports mm. this More is visible yeah so yes right. that is also required mm-hmm. at yeah, least to you know mm-hmm. uh, address mm-hmm. the constraints on the supply side mm-hmm. uh, that's required but we also definitely need investment in in ece and uh, as sudarshan put it right at the beginning it's not really a cost it's an investment and uh, we need that kind of political will and then i think once that beginning is made we will hopefully see a gradual improvement in the resource allocation in terms of uh, my last point on center state sharing uh, on, on uh, finance commission grants yes there could also be some scope to mobilize some resources from the central finance commission grants and state finance commission grants for the rural local bodies mm. so that's also something which could be explored last point on center state sharing of resources uh, both union ministry of finance and state finance departments will be uh, all right with the one time costs that's what we are observing mm-hmm. in in terms of the preference of of budget makers uh, so one time in uh, costs capital expenditure or any one time uh, grant is something which is not registered much but when it comes to recurring expenses mm. yeah. that is more contentious yeah. and especially expenses on staff staff salaries so that's seen as quote unquote a committed liability which nobody is willing to uh, pick up and uh, since 2017 18 government of india has been asking the states to take up a much greater share of the responsibility for financing of salaries of the frontline service providers in social sectors mm. that also is something which the states are not very happy <coughs> with and that's i think an unresolved issue in terms of uh, the mm. financing pattern of uh, salaries of the frontline service providers uh, the states argument is that they already have a lot of uh, mm. competitive you know competing demand uh, to to fulfill and hence the center should not withdraw from financing uh, a significant part of staff salaries that debate is definitely going to come up when we take the advocacy to the states for the ec sector so even in our study i mean i agree with what renu said who is going to be the ec service provider and how much is going to be their salary that's the most contentious issue mm. we have for obvious reasons taken a position as i said to lend support to rights based advocacy mm. in the sector that was a deliberate choice we made but i am cognizant of the uh, operational challenges that that renu flagged it's not what we are going to get in several states for instance so 
I was aware when when I, I agreed uh, uh, and and uh, Pratibha Asad. Uh, Nilachal and other colleagues, all of us, when we agreed to do this study with SAVE, we realized that we would answer a few questions and raise some raise more. Uh, <laughs> uh, open up many more, which we won't be able to answer. <laughs> but I'm glad that we are discussing these issues. No, great. I think no, no, this is this is very helpful. And uh, like you said, no easy answers. So is it self? Is it taxation? You know, how do you balance the center state? And I think that has a lot of implications, even in terms of taking some of our conversations forward with the government at the central and the state level but uh, at least the conversation has been initiated there is there is a proposal on which you know we can we can start having a conversation and also advocating and uh, like like kamal said it's not the end you know it's, this is just this is just we've just taken baby steps and you know uh, you you pratibha very clearly said it's an honest attempt that they have <laughs> taken some some uh, some simple. You know, I would not say simple, but you know, it is a, it is an honest attempt, and um, definitely raising more questions. But I think in the end, just to kind of sum up this whole uh, conversation since morning, and also you know, with the panel, the fact that we all agree that the time for you know investing on ECE uh, has come, and it is you know, uh, it is now, uh, and it is it is like like Sudarshan said in the beginning, you know, the fact that. It's 75 years we are completing of uh, India's uh, independence, and for the next 25 years, I think you know definitely that's a, that's an important, powerful message we need to take to the government. We need to actually ensure that citizens also take it up. You know, in terms of so this whole element of supply and demand, the fact that uh, there is a requirement to have, uh, like like ma'am you stated, it's very important that we need to have standardization. I think that's extremely critical. So when we are saying EC is important, I think the standardization in terms of whether it's curriculum, whether it is you know mm -hmm. standards for uh, for teachers, their qualification, because we are not talking about only excess. We are talking about quality, and I think <coughs> that's, that's a critical piece. You know, we are talking about quality. We are talking about equitable access to quality EC uh, your education. So universalization components. I think that's that's extremely critical. There is a whole element of ensuring that. The systems, you know, uh, how prepared are we? We have an enabling policy environment. There are already elements of, you know, NEP being rolled out. There is this whole element of foundational literacy, numeracy. You have Nipun Bharat. You know, government is actually looking at some of those. So some structures are there. How do we ensure we kind of effectively implement it? And then definitely the financing element, I think, you know, because that's the gap in terms of also evidence. Because I know when we used to do budget advocacy, and when we talked about the extension of RT Act, you know, uh, downwards and upwards, they used to say, how much will it cost? Yeah. Even if the political party said, we'll put it in a manifesto, you tell us how much it will cost. So at least now we have a cost, you know, we have a figure, whether it is 1.5 to 2.2 or whether it is your 0.9%, even those people who've been left out, you know, even if we can cover that, I think maybe like a phased out strategy rather than immediately saying invest, you know, 2.5, if we say, okay, 0.9, to be able to at least address those 37 million who are still out of the ECE framework. So uh, with that, I would just like to kind of uh, conclude. Uh, thank you so much, all of you. And like I said, it's a milestone. Uh, I would definitely say it's a milestone in, in the education history in India. And uh, the conversation continues. And we look forward to all your engagement as we move forward. Thank you so much to all the speakers and the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Please join us for tea. Yes. Okay. And there is. No, no, no. I mean, yeah, I think you have already Sorry. thanked. But I would just reiterate it is the, just the beginning of a movement. It's the right start that we can ensure for every child. And with that, would uh, request all of you to join us for tea and snacks. Thank you. आपकी बात कमरे से बाहर तक भी जाएगी। अगर आप इन लोगों से बात करें ना, हाँ मैं उनकी